and welcome to part 63 of my report on the McCarrick Report by Patrick Parson. We continue chapter 19, information about McCarrick's past conduct received during his tenure as Archbishop of Washington, 2001 to 2006. Looking at part D, information received related to priest one, and McCarrick's resignation as Archbishop of Washington, 2005 to 2006, we find that allegations of sexual misconduct by McCarrick are becoming more serious. At this time also, Archbishop Montalvo retired as Apostolic Nuncio to the United States on December 17, 2005, although he remained in office until his replacement. Archbishop Pietro Sambi was installed early in 2006. Sambi had a reputation as a person of integrity and insight, as well as a short temper which sometimes made him scream at people. Cardinal Ray wrote to Still Nuncio Montalvo on December 28th, telling Montalvo to start the process for replacing McCarrick as Archbishop of Washington at Easter, and stating the good of the Church required implementation in such a way not to disseminate information known to few people. In other words, the reputation of the Church was more important than the quick removal of a problem. McCarrick wrote to Cardinal Ray on January 17, 2006, thanking Ray for the sensitivity Ray showed regarding the allegations against McCarrick. McCarrick also said he was troubled by the false information which Ray had received and apparently believed. He also added, I would never have accepted promotion to Newark or Washington if I thought I would ever be a scandal to the Church. I hope I love the Lord and the Church more than that. My life has always been open. I have always lived with priests or bishops, holy men and wives. For the last 25 years as an ordinary, everyone has always known where I am and with who I am at all times. McCarrick met with Ray in Rome on January 17, 2006, and McCarrick gave Ray a three-page memorandum, which he said would help clarify their earlier conversation. The memo contained several points by McCarrick. One, I had never had sexual relations with any person, man, woman, or child. Two, I have never lived a double life, nor have I ever been sexually active in any way. Three, McCarrick described his phenomenal success in recruiting seminarians and ordaining priests. Four, he was aware of no insinuations of improper conduct made against him by the priests and seminarians who were invited to his house. Five, he stopped inviting groups of seminarians due to the unhealthy concentration of media on abuse. Six, every two or three years, some anonymous persons would express rumor about the house, but never was there found any evidence of improper conduct. Seven, only one name has surfaced in these rumors of sexual conduct. Here is what McCarrick knows. A. Perhaps 15 years ago, a lawyer friend mentioned an allegation had been made, but McCarrick presumed it was deemed non credible, since no one spoke to him about it. 
B. Ten years ago, someone mentioned a priest involved in the sexual abuse of children indicated that McCarrick had sexual relationships with them. McCarrick judged this, McCarrick presumed this was judged false. C. The Bishop of Metuchen told McCarrick he had settled a case with the priest, which troubled McCarrick, but his attorney advised against responding publicly. We will continue in our next segment with McCarrick's memorandum to Cardinal Ray. McCarrick's letter appears to be that of an innocent man obviously wronged by such unspeakable allegations. All of us are wronged in some manner by others, but even if innocent in some areas, we are each guilty of sin in others. Instead of protesting our innocence, let us instead say the Fatima prayer. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. <laughs> 